Let's pray. Oh God, our Redeemer, we give you praise that we can come before you. You have made us for your praise. You have created us for your glory. And look what we've done with ourselves. You are not just our maker and our sustainer, but also our redeemer. The one who rescues us from everything we've made of ourselves. The one who rescues us from us. From the consequences of our sin and from your wrath. God, we thank you that we can hear from you in your word. That you have not left us to our own schemes and our own devices. You have not just let us go our own way. But you are a gracious and merciful God. Seeking a people for your own possession. Eager to redeem. Quick to forgive. Desirous for reconciliation. And you have done all the work. You have done everything that is required, everything that is necessary for our salvation. And we can only say thank you, praise you. As we come now to your word, we pray that you would help us to see ourselves rightly. We pray that you would help us to see you even better. And we ask, O oh God, that your word would have its way in our hearts and our lives for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. In the early years of World War II, German U-boats, submarines, were pounding Allied shipping in the North Atlantic. And because these German submarines were so efficient at seeking our transports, we were having a difficult time delivering the equipment the supplies, and the men that were so crucial to the war effort in Europe. American strategists and engineers struggled to come up with ways of getting around the U-boat threat. One seemingly impossible solution was brought forth. Build an airplane. Build an airplane big enough to fly the supplies across the Atlantic. Uh, the U-boats couldn't touch air transport. But there was no such plane big enough for such a task. Not even close. From this need emerged the HK-1 Hercules. It was the pinnacle of aviation and engineering greatness. It was designed to carry hundreds of troops, full-size tanks, 50 tons of cargo. Nothing like it had ever been previously conceived. It was a seaplane some 218 feet long. That's twice the length of a B-29 superfortress that ended the war only slightly shorter than today's 747s, with a 320-foot wingspan and a tail that was bigger than a B-17. It had a 200-ton gross weight and was powered by eight massive radial engines. Because of the scarcity of aluminum during the war, the airplane was built almost entirely out of birch. And the HK-1 Hercules was a marvel of aviation engineering, the pinnacle of technology. It was a marvel of man's creative genius. And perhaps you've never heard of the HK-1 Hercules. This gargantuan transport would purportedly turn the tide of World War II. You may know this airplane by its other name, the Spruce Goose. For all of its greatness, for all of its capacity, for all of its genius in engineering and construction, the Spruce Goose never carried a single tank to the battlefield never carried a single soldier to Europe, and never one ounce of supplies to the battlefield where they were so desperately needed in the crucial days of the war. Budget constraints, coupled with tangled webs of bureaucratic interference, and an eccentric builder saw that the Spruce Goose would never see military service. Ironically, and at the cost of $7 million to the builder, the HK-1 Hercules was completed in 1947. After the war was over, too late to fulfill its design. The Spruce Goose is a renowned, tragic failure in the annals of aviation history because it was never able to live up to its purpose. Its genius and its ability were squandered. In fact, it only flew one time and then barely a mile, just above the surface of Long Beach Harbor. It is one of the great disappointments 
from perhaps the greatest engineering mind in aviation history. This morning, we want to look at the great disappointment experienced by another great mind, the greatest human mind the world has ever known, King Solomon. Now some 3,000 years gone, he is still the smartest man who has ever lived, apart from the God-man, Jesus Christ. What we're going to read this morning, what we'll read this morning is Solomon's expression of tragic disappointment. Will you look together with me at Ecclesiastes chapter 7? Right here in the middle of the book, Solomon revisits a theme that has happened several occasions in this book. It's a despair over the great enterprise of his pursuit of wisdom. And we read his great disappointment beginning in verse 23. Solomon says, I tested all of this with wisdom and I said, I will be wise. But it was far from me. What has been is remote and exceedingly mysterious. Who can discover it? I directed my mind to know and to investigate and to seek wisdom and an explanation and to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. And I discovered more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are chains. The one who is pleasing to God will escape from her, but the sinner will be captured by her. Behold, I have discovered this, says the preacher, adding one thing to another to find an explanation, which I'm still speaking, but I, seeking, but I have not found. I found one man among a thousand, but I have not found a woman among all these. Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. We're going to look this morning at two monumental disappointments that Solomon expresses, and, and they really get wrapped up into the second one. The first disappointment we look at in Solomon's life this morning is Solomon's unsatisfying search for human wisdom. His unsatisfying search for human wisdom, and this is in verses 23 to 25. Notice in verse 23, Solomon says, I tested all this with wisdom. Uh, all this referring to the principles he's brought up previously in chapter 7, and, and I believe applies also to the entire nature of his experiment, uh, going back to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, where Solomon sought to find meaning under the sun and tested everything there was to be tested, took all of life, put it in a Petri dish, put on his white laboratory coat, jumped in, and played with life. Can I find meaning in things under the sun? And he tested it, verse 23. And he said, I will be wise. And we see here Solomon's very beginning of his search for wisdom is rooted in himself. He was wise as a young boy, wise as a young king, and yet he knew enough to know that he wasn't wise. And so he asked for wisdom, and God gave him supernatural wisdom and said, you're the smartest man who's ever lived, and you're the smartest one who will ever live. No one will be like you after you. And what did Solomon do with the wisdom with which he was born and the wisdom he was supernaturally given? He didn't apply it very wisely. He sought to take all of this wisdom and experiment with life. Eyes wide open experiment into madness and folly and even sin. And so the one who said the beginning of wisdom is the fear of Yahweh abandoned the fear of Yahweh and used his gifts to please himself to see, see if he could find meaning apart from Yahweh. And what is his conclusion in all of this test, all of this search for wisdom, all of this, I have wisdom, God gave me wisdom, I'm going to use that wisdom to find more wisdom, and it was far from me, he says. Notice verse 24, what has been is remote, and it's exceedingly mysterious. Who can discover it? And the reality is, if the smartest man who has ever lived hasn't found it, you and I don't have hope. <laughs> not in the same path, not with the same methodology, not with the same experiment that Solomon tried. We cannot out-Solomon Solomon on this one. What he was looking for was undiscoverable. In Ecclesiastes 7, 23 and 24, 
could readily be etched on the headstones of all the world's great thinkers. And perhaps it would be good if every freshman philosophy major walked past such headstones as he set out to fill his mind with the intellectual meanderings of men who, with lesser abilities than Solomon, reattempted his sad experiment. Notice Solomon's intentionality in verse 25. I directed my mind to know, to investigate, and to seek wisdom. Solomon didn't just stumble into reading a few good books. Solomon didn't just wander around thinking thoughts. No, he was very intentional, very precise in his approach to wisdom. He wanted to investigate, verse 25, to seek wisdom and an explanation. And then listen to this, to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. It's one thing to look at folly from a distance and, and learn by someone else's example. Solomon became the example and learned experientially the suicidal nature of folly and madness. You've heard that curiosity killed the cat. Some things aren't worth studying how did that work out for Adam and Eve? Do you remember the tree in the garden was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And the tempter came and said, you'll be like God, for now you will know evil. Well, they wouldn't know evil the way God knows evil, distant, unattached, but omniscient. No, they would know evil by firsthand experience. And it was a suicide. It was the death of Adam and Eve and the death of the entirety of the human race. Tragic consequences to this kind of curiosity that brought about destruction and disease and death for us all. For Solomon, a wise man who prized wisdom, the emptiness of his search must have been excruciatingly discouraging. And you know, his hunt for wisdom was foiled by three factors. We've seen these in Ecclesiastes. First of all, Solomon's under-the-sun approach to the search for wisdom meant that he would never find it, right? He himself would say that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He abandoned the fear of the Lord by pursuing things that God hates. And so he was never going to find wisdom under the sun, never going to find wisdom in the approach that he took. There's a second reason that Solomon's approach to wisdom would be foiled. The, the, The kind of information he was seeking was foiled by God's inscrutable providence, That is, there are things which God withholds because he's God and we are creatures. He's the one who said in Isaiah 55, my ways are higher than yours. My thoughts are different than yours. The secret things belong to Yahweh, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The things that he reveals are for us and for our children so they may teach them and do them. But God as infinite in his knowledge will always be above and beyond us. So any approach to wisdom that erroneously seeks every answer to everything, (laughs) will fail. Some of those things are not for us. And the third reason, and I think the one that's highlighted here in this passage, why Solomon's pursuit of wisdom would fail, is because of the very nature of humanity. An under-the-sun pursuit of wisdom fails because we are failures. Universal human depravity isn't just about what we do that displeases God. It's about who we are by nature, and it affects how we think and how we feel, what we love and what we hate. Depravity affects every capacity of the human constitution. That is the heartbeat of this passage, and that is really the great disappointment that Solomon turns to beginning in verse 26. Solomon is disappointed with the unsatisfying search for human wisdom, but that itself is grounded in Solomon's unnerving discovery of human nature. His unnerving discovery of human nature. What is man like? Look at verse 26. He starts by saying, and I discovered. So he searched, he investigated, he looked, he experimented. And in verses 26 to 29, we have his findings. His findings. And they... They all center around who we are. What does he discover first? Something that is painful. So painful by experience and its consequences 
that he would compare it to the bitterness of death. Look what he says in verse 26. I discovered more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets whose hands are chains. Solomon had lived long enough to experience death, the death of loved ones, the death of family, perhaps the death of friends. He knew the bitterness that that great enemy of humanity is. And you who have tasted that bitterness, you know the depths of that bitterness, the pain that that enemy brings. And Solomon says there's something more bitter than that. And it is a woman. The woman whose heart is snares and nets. He says her heart, uh, that, the very disposition of who she is, her, her central command center, her, her mind, her brain, are geared towards something. And, and she's geared towards being something of a hunter. Her heart is snares and nets. These are words that are used to describe one who hunts birds, lays traps for birds, catches them. Her snares and nets are the weapons of the hunter. And notice her hands are chains. What is the result of the activities of this woman? Uh, slavery. This is a trap. I read recently about a beetle of the genus Epomis. And at the larval stage, the, the baby version of this beetle looks like a great thing to eat. If you're a salamander or a toad or a frog. Amphibians target these kinds of things for breakfast. But this larva is not something you want to eat if you're a frog. This larva has giant pinchers on its front of its face, that once it is ingested, it grabs on. So you think you've found dinner, and dinner has found you. This is the dinner that eats you from the inside, and it begins to exude digestive enzymes while it holds on to the inside of the frog, and in a bloodless, slow death, digests it from the inside out. That's just the baby stage. Cute little toddler. <laughs> it said that this larva would consume eight or nine amphibians before it reaches adulthood. And when it reaches adulthood in the beetle stage, uh, it doesn't look like something yummy to eat anymore to a, tog or a frog or a toad, but instead will hunt down the frog, jump on its back, and clamp on with, it, with its teeth, and it will snip the leg muscle connecting tissue so that the frog or the toad can no longer move and then eats it slowly while it's alive. What's the point of that illustration? I, it was <laughs> a bug I don't ever want to meet. That's the Ecclesiastes 7 woman. That's the Ecclesiastes 7 woman. A snare and a trap. Enticing, appealing, attractive death. Solomon knew this. Solomon experienced this bitterness. Look in verse 27. Here's another discovery. Another discovery. He says, behold, look. <laughs> look at this. I've discovered something. What is it that Solomon discovers in verse 27? I've discovered this, adding one thing to another to find an explanation. Verse 28, which I'm still seeking but have not found. <laughs> what does that mean? I found something else. What did he discover? He discovered that he's still looking for something that he hasn't found. Right? Insert you two, I have run, I have crawled, I have scaled these city walls, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. That's what Solomon has discovered. What was it that he was looking for? What was it that he could not find? A human that lived up to what he was designed for. A 
human that lived up to what he was designed for. And he comes to that conclusion in verse 29. He says, behold, I have found only this. Oh, that's, that's the discovery. That God made men upright, but they have sought many schemes. Before he gets to verse 29, he gets us to the conclusion of universal depravity there, but in the meantime, he takes us on a survey of the specimens of humanity in his own circles of experience. And back in verse 26, his recommendation was, escape the woman whose heart is snares and nets. The one who is pleasing to God runs away from her. And then he describes the people that he had been around. Admirable men, admirable women. Notice verse 28, I have found one man among a thousand. By the way, that's one-tenth of one percent of the people in Solomon's experience. And I have not found a woman among all these. These are striking statements. And I don't think Solomon has in mind precise mathematical calculations, right? One-twentieth of one percent of all the people he knew were horrible people. Um, This might be something like a phrase that we use. uh, That guy is one in a million of the admirable men in in Solomon's circle. You you and I might think of someone like Nathan the prophet. Remember Nathan was the, the godly man who had confronted David, Solomon's father, on his own sin. He was still alive and around in Solomon's day. Maybe Solomon might think of a guy like that and couldn't think of any ways that Nathan had disappointed him. And so, yeah, maybe there's a a good guy. (laughs) That's not a statement that Nathan himself doesn't fall into the category of verse 29. That's the conclusion Solomon is driving us towards. But when Solomon thinks about all the females in his life, he, he couldn't come up with even one like that. What a tragic discovery. I mean, think about how a godly woman is an under-the-sun treasure. Maybe the best thing in life for a man who loves God. God himself said it's not good for a man to be alone, and so God created woman. Solomon himself in Proverbs 18.22 said, He who finds a wife finds what is good, and he receives favor from Yahweh. And didn't Solomon write a book called The Song of Solomon? Who was that girl? And what happened? What happened to Solomon that, that such a negative view has occurred so that he can't think of one upstanding woman in his circle? First Kings 11.3 happened. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. You see, Solomon married in large part for political alliances. He married the daughter of Pharaoh, ruler of Egypt. In order to make peace, he he bought peace by his marriage alliances. Uh, Egypt wasn't going to attack Israel if the Pharaoh's daughter was in the castle. And he did this 700 times over. And, And then the other women in his court weren't quite wives. A thousand women. You know, in Proverbs 18.22, Solomon had said, he who finds a wife finds what is good. That number is important, a wife. Not a thousand. Solomon had messed up the whole idea of what marriage is supposed to be. Had trounced what a beauty and what a treasure a godly woman is supposed to be. Listen to Nehemiah 13.26. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin regarding these things? Yet among the many nations, there was no king like him, and he was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, the foreign women caused even him to sin. He knew about the woman whose heart was snares and nets and whose hands were chains, and he didn't flee. He experienced 
firsthand the bitterness worse than death. Consider a king's court with all the wealth and status and privilege and power and what kind of women would be attracted to that kind of a setup? Probably not the Proverbs 31 type of woman or the Proverbs 18.22 kind of woman. Think about even if such a woman were to enter that environment, what that environment might do to a woman. When you think about Solomon's indictment of the women that were in his circles, it is an indictment of the corruption of his own heart. This situation was a situation of his own making. And while every woman that Solomon might think of in this category is responsible before God for her own sin, Solomon is the one who surrounded himself with the kind of women that fit this category. And later on in this book in Ecclesiastes 9.9, Solomon gives some remarkably good advice. Advice that he himself did not and later in life could not keep. Listen to what he says. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life which he has given to you under the sun. For this is your reward in life and your toil in which you have labored under the sun. And poor Solomon had to give that advice and observe its joys from a distance because he could not experience them himself. Plenty of other proverbs that Solomon gives exalting the the greatness of the gift of a godly woman. And then King Lemuel in Proverbs 31 does the same. And all of these are illustrative of the principle, the universal reality that Solomon drives at in verse 29. Read that with me. Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. This is Solomon's statement on universal human depravity. This is opposite the diagram that you learned in school. You know, the apes to human progression, uh, walking on all fours to hunched over, dragging knuckles to upright modern man. But from the sixth day of history of the universe and from day one of human history, mankind was upright, created so by God. But you know that this statement from Solomon is not really about posture. It's about humanity standing before God. It's about mankind's character, his behavior, his moral nature. And we have to think back to how God created mankind originally. Marvelous beings designed to govern the created world with capacities suited for that task. Man and woman were made in God's very image after his likeness, to be sub-regents on the earth, to rule and to govern in his place over the created order. They were built for relationships with each other and for a perfect relationship with God. They were built to communicate. They were endowed with intellectual capacities for invention and creativity. They were equipped with analytical abilities for self-awareness and scientific inquiry. The disappointment of what we have become is magnified by the greatness from which we descended. You see, the history of humanity is a history of the tragedy of squandered greatness. Notice the second half of verse 29. They have sought out many devices. That is, man has intentionally gone after schemes. Man has become a a schemer. This is a, a negative word designed at the to get at the way that man has run away from God's plans and come up with his own in his rebellion. John Calvin said this about the image of God in man. He said, we grant that God's image was not totally annihilated or destroyed in him, yet it was so corrupted that whatever remains is frightful deformity. This is the tragedy of squandered capacity. Man's primary reason for existence is to glorify God, to enjoy God. But ever since the fall, man has employed his endowments in the pursuit of sin and evil. Consider man's capacities with me for just a few moments. 
Think about man's ability for communication. We were given the gift of speech. And listen to how James describes our speech. He says, the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. We were given the gift of speech to understand God's thoughts and to be able to communicate and commune with Him and communicate and commune with one another. And we revile Him and blaspheme Him and curse each other. Think about man's capacity for creativity. The ability to take the things that God Himself has made out of nothing and rearrange them. And man's incredible capacity to reflect and to bring glory to God's genius through creativity has been corrupted, corrupted by sin, so that all of our abilities for music and art and engineering and literature have all become implements of godlessness in the hands of God's sinful creatures. Think about our capacity for self-awareness and for understanding. We were supposed to use our awareness of our place in the universe to recognize our dependence as creatures upon God. And we've turned that self-awareness into independence and a self-proclaimed autonomy. Proverbs 19.3 says, The foolishness of man ruins his way and his heart rages against Yahweh. The last thing a natural man wants to do now is to joyfully submit to the sovereign rulership of God. He wants to be his own God and to rule his own universe and not let anybody tell him what to do. He wants to claim existential autonomy. He denies the obvious reality that every breath is given to him by God. We are in reality dependent, but we act independent and autonomous. And our self-awareness has turned to self-exaltation. Consider mankind's innate sense of destiny and history. That is, the ability to think outside of ourselves, to reflect on the past and to contemplate the future. Instead, we tend to live for the moment. To pursue instant gratification, we become slaves to Darwinian self-preservation and temporal gluttony. Consider the intellect given by God. One of the effects of an inherited sin nature is the corruption of our intelligence Somewhat like a computer virus, sin has gotten into our ability to think straight and to process information. Our intellect has been darkened. Listen to Jesus' assessment in John chapter 1, verse 5. Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. What does that mean? Jesus himself, the light of the world, was here, and we were so darkened in our thinking, we didn't know light when we saw it. Listen to Romans 8. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. And those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Consider our ability for reason and rational ability. Because of sin's effects on our minds, we have lost the capacity for clear and unobstructed logic and reason. As much as we'd like to think we're capable of objective reasoning... We're enslaved to sin at the thought level. Jeremiah 4.22, For my people are foolish, they know me not. They are stupid children and they have no understanding. They are shrewd to do evil, but to do good they do not know. And Jeremiah 17.9, The heart, the brain, the mind is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Think about the will and the human constitution. The will is designed by God for us to bring God glory in our abilities, in our abilities to choose good over evil. And yet, what does mankind do? Genesis 6, 5. Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It was God's assessment pre-flood. 
It wiped everybody off the map except for eight. But after the flood, same problem persists. Genesis 8, 21. The intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And Jesus says in John 5, 40, you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. The will in the human constitution is broken, infected by sin, corrupt, so that we don't want the very things we should want most, the very things that would save us. And so no one comes to Jesus except the Father draw him. Consider our emotions. The well of our soul's feelings and desires, designed as a palette for the increased enjoyment of God's various excellencies, instead has become a fountain of misery and pollution. Jesus said, for out of the heart come evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and fornications, thefts, false witnesses and slanders. Disney tells us, follow your heart, do what you feel. Our feelings are corrupt and they lead to death. Consider mankind's capacity for morality. That innate sense of good and evil has been severely damaged. And although even after the fall, we're born with a knowledge of right and wrong, we we spend our lives trying to rewrite that knowledge. And even where that right knowledge remains in the conscience, we don't obey what we know to be right. Psalm 14, 1 to 4, they are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. Yahweh has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Consider our affections, what we love, what we hate. They've been completely upended by the fall. Jesus said in John 3.19, this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. How crazy is that? Light and life we despise. We love the wrong things. We hate the wrong things. Thomas Boston said it this way, the heart that was made according to God's own heart is now the reverse of it. A forge of evil imaginations, a sink of inordinate affections, and a storehouse of all impiety. Behold the heart of the natural man. The mind is defiled. The thoughts of the heart are evil. The will and the affections are defiled. Consider our capacity for science. Our thirst for knowledge and our ability to study. They've been employed in every kind of vice and godless pursuit imaginable. And what is thought to be objective science is often based on an anti-supernaturalistic presupposition that cripples science at its very foundation. Romans 1 tells us, although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor they gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Mankind was also endowed with immortality. The ability to exist forever. And while man still is immortal, he faces the reality of death, physical death here, and eternal death. A death that is forever conscious, forever existent, but apart from everything that is good and pleasing. An eternity of suffering the consequences of sin and hell under the wrath of God. And mankind, since the fall, is subject to death. We were born dead, spiritually speaking. And we must be raised to new life if there is to be any hope. Romans 5, 12, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men on account of which everybody sinned. Consider man's capacity Capacity for responsibility or lordship or kingship or governorship. Man's role as the subregion of God on the earth. What does man do with his responsibility? Abuses it or neglects it. Either through selfishness or greed, man has not been a good steward of the created order. We take the capacity for dominion and exert it sinfully in domination over other people. Or abdicate it totally. 
in rejection of God. Man was given a capacity for adoration, a capacity for worship, for looking up and thinking about things bigger than himself. And man has taken that intrinsic capacity for reverence and worship and turned it away from the infinite God and turned it toward any old created thing. Stars, sticks, rocks, people, ideas, anything and everything but the one true God. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, Paul says in Romans 1. And they worshiped and served the created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. The best gift of all, man was given, created with a capacity for relationship to God. And that has been broken. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold, Yahweh's hand is not so short that he cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. What have we made of ourselves? Much like Howard Hughes, that eccentric billionaire who designed and flew the spruce goose. He was the son of a wealthy oil man and a rich heiress from Texas. He invested wisely and made a fortune, at one point becoming the richest man on earth. He was a genius, an engineer, a visionary, and a pilot. And when he flew his HK-1 Hercules in Long Beach Harbor on November 1947, he was simply trying to prove that his now obsolete and over-budget dream really could get into the air. And the spruce goose flew for less than 60 seconds at a cost of about $417,000 per second, which is more than it cost us to put men on the moon. It was kept in a climate-controlled hangar in Long Beach for over three decades, Howard Hughes demanded that, demanded that 300 people, full-time workers, keep it in ready-to-fly condition. And it never flew again. Like his Herculean seaplane, Howard Hughes became a recluse until his death in 1976. He died a wasted genius, a secluded and germaphobic billionaire, an icon of squandered capacity. Howard Hughes' life was characterized by vanity, chasing after the wind. This is how Jonathan Edwards described humanity as a whole, the the tragedy of squandered capacity. Jonathan Edwards wrote this, see how much God has bestowed upon you in the endowments of your nature. God has made you rational, intelligent creatures. He has endued you with noble powers, those endowments wherein the natural image of God consists. You are vastly exalted in your nature above other kinds of creatures here below. You are capable of a thousand times as much as any of the brute creatures. He has given you a power of understanding, which is capable of extending itself, of looking back to the beginning of time and of considering what was before the world and looking forward beyond the end of time. It is capable of extending beyond the utmost limits of the universe, and it is a faculty whereby you are akin to the angels. You are even capable of knowing and contemplating the divine being and his glorious perfections. Manifested in his works and in his word, you have souls capable of being the habitation of the Holy Spirit of God, of his divine grace. How lamentable and shameful it is that such a creature should be altogether useless and live in vain. How lamentable that such a noble piece of divine workmanship should fail of its end and be to no purpose. Was it ever worthwhile for God to make you such a creature with such a noble nature and so much above other kinds of creatures only to eat and drink and gratify your sensual appetites? The great disappointment The great disappointment that Solomon experienced, the great problem of the search for wisdom under the sun, is us. The problem is me. And I can never be the answer to my most fundamental problem. This is the basic flaw of every human religion. Seeking in man the answers to the problem that man is. The problem is me. And the answer is Jesus. 
This is the glory of the gospel, the, the beauty of the good news which God proclaims to every one of you here this morning. A rescue from you. A rescue from yourself. For everything you've made of yourself and, and for the consequences of who you are and what you've done. A rescue from the just punishment against your sins. The good news is that God is ready and eager to rescue you from himself. We bent what God made straight or upright. We learn in Ecclesiastes 7.13 that God then bent the world around us and nobody can straighten it. And God is in the business of straightening what we have bent. He is a God whose heart is to save, to rescue, to redeem, to forgive. And God himself came in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, to live under the curse, to experience the curse, to go to a cross and hang between earth and heaven, between man and God, so that God could pour out all the sins of everyone who would ever believe, past, present, and future, and place them on Jesus, his precious son. And then pour out on that beloved son all of his anger against all of those sins and pay for them completely to bring you to himself, to redeem for himself a, a people forgiven, a people made new, a people who will be brought into conformity with the glorious resurrection personhood of his own son. That you and I could be what humanity was designed to be in the beginning. And to have the glorious perfection of God's highest creatures with all of those wonderful capacities renewed perfectly. To live up to the purpose for which we were created. And to never be able to lose it again. That is the hope of the gospel. That is the confidence we have in the future for all who are in Christ Jesus to have the Garden of Eden back again, but better, permanent, forever, unlosable. Will you pray with me? God, when we think about ourselves rightly, we feel small. And we think about you rightly, you loom large, infinite, glorious, powerful, awesome, and yet kind, patient, eager to forgive our sins, eager for us to know you, with whom we have no business being in your presence. I thank you, God, that you do not leave us as we come, but you forgive us, declare us to be righteous, and then begin the work of making us so. One day you will complete that work, and that day when we, were home, when we are home in your presence, unable to sin, only able to do that which is pleasing to you in the fullness of our capacities, we long for that day. And until that day, may we be those who boast in this great news of what you do for all who would believe. In Jesus' name.